Hello and welcome to our latest GT Maritime webinar. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Robert Kenworthy and I'm the founder and CEO of GT Maritime. In view of the terrible, unprecedented times which we find ourselves in, and the fact that we're still facing a dismal few more months, I thought I should put a webinar together that may bring a little light relief to, to you all, as well as being informative. We all spend a lot of time talking about the future, so I wanted to give you a bit of background on how I started and how I got to this point. A background of Merchant Navy, telecommunications, business development, satellite communications, and also how GT Marinat was formed. And then show how this has shaped all the exciting new developments we have coming for this year. Some of the following will be enlightening for the younger people amongst you, but the older seafarers amongst you, well, you will have had that experience probably already. And let's see how it goes. I started my career at the age of, age of 18 years old and joined the Merchant Navy as a deck cadet. And the company was British and Commonwealth in 1975. Selling in old general cargo ships, fruit ships and bulk carriers all over the world. Part of the BNC group was a company called Clan Line Steamers that had been ship owners since 1848. They sailed general cargo ships mainly around South and East Africa, Ascension Islands, St. Helena, India, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh and Mauritius. The general cargo ship transported everything apart from oil products and bulk cargo. Most things they needed to be transported came to our huge clan line sheds in Birkenhead, ready to be loaded on board. The goods mostly came in wooden cases of old sizes called CKDs. Don't ask me where that came from. And they contained machinery, consumer items, railway equipment. Some goods were on pallets, such as bags of fertilizer or other chemicals. We carried small delivery trucks, vintage cars, huge mining equipment, and also diamond crushers and gas canisters in their thousands. Hundreds of tons of spirits and pallets of canned beer, sadly under lock and key. And much, much more. On one occasion, as the illustration shows, on one occasion I recall transporting a fully operational steam engine. On the return journey, we would transport copper, zinc, asbestos, fish meal, animal hides, tobacco, tea, tropical, timber, plus much more for Northern European ports. My first trip was to South Africa. And I'll never forget my introduction to Africa, that great mysterious continent as yet not fully explored. I was on the 408 watch with the chief mate. It was a dark, starry night, so full of stars, the light from them would light up your hand. As the sun began to rise from the east, entering this huge African sky, casting a magnificent yellow-orange hue, I asked, what was that? And I watched in awe as Table Mountain slowly rose above the horizon, as if from the sea, entering this magnificent sky making one of the most spectacular skylines ever. Just as slowly, I then began to see little twinkling lights of the city of Cape Town that nestled below this amazing mountain. I couldn't help thinking that this was how those early settlers and explorers would have seen Africa for the first time. I too had been given the privilege to witness this amazing sight, a sight that will never leave me for the rest of my life. On entering Table Bay, the chief mate pointed out Robben Island. As we sailed past it, he explained to me who was in prison there. He went on to explain the apartheid system and the politi politics of South Africa. In 1975, when I sailed by, Nelson Mandela was still incarcerated in that prison, serving his unjust sentence eventually for 27 years. Back in the 70s and 80s, communications on board a vessel were a very crew-intensive process. When on duty, the radio officer would have to listen continuously to 500 kilohertz on the WT distress frequency and observing the silence periods of 15 and 18 and 45 and 48 minutes past each hour. And then, of course, the uh, three minutes and the 33 minutes, uh, 30 to 33 minutes on the 2182 uh, frequency band. This was reminded by the radio room clock. 
also during the watch he or she would take the weather forecast for the area the ship was in. They also had to take the navigational warnings for the area the ship was in. Once a day they corrected the clocks from a rugby transmitter low frequency time signal. During each two hour watch the radio officer also had a 10 minute company intership schedule to listen into. This could be for either intership chit chat such as uh, crew lists, changes and, and things that are going on on different ships. Or towards the end of the voyage, the company user sent out the leave arrangements message for all the officers and crew. Occasionally, the radio officer had to deal with the medical emergency messages through Rome Radio, where they could get medical advice for the ship's captain or purser to assist with any medical issues on board. Every six hours, there was a meteorological observation message to be sent out to the nearby OBS receiving station. Each watch they would be also listening to the traffic list for the country or port that the vessel was heading for. This may have been for berthing or loading or discharging information. The captain would generally send messages to the company on a daily basis, usually with the noon position, fuel used and remaining fuel and water. The chief engineer would often be ordering fuel and water for each port and occasionally small spare parts. The purser will be ordering fresh fruit and veg for each port and every two months or so would send in an enormous long stores order message. And then of course there was the fixing of any of the electronic equipment on the bridge such as the radar or the gyro. But that was just for business. The radio officer also looked after the officers and crew for personal messages, telegrams, phone calls, interflora messages for family events. He'd take the football results as well as uh, other things that people would request. Although this sounds like a busy job for one man, it has now struck me just how little we did communi communicate in those days when compared to today's communications. For example, today, for the 5,000 ships, 600 ships that are using GTML Plus, our servers are processing over 11 million emails per month. That's over 2,000 emails per vessel per month, which equates to 66 messages per ship every day. When on board back in the 70s, the communications with home was very limited. Other than being able to make a call home for a family member's birthday, nearly all communications was via post. But even when we did call home, we didn't get, a, get to have a much private conversation. Here's a, a story I, I can recall. Um, I remember on one occasion making a voice call by Porter's Head Radio from somewhere in the Indian Ocean to my girlfriend at the time. It was Saturday night, so many British ships were trying to do the same. Everyone had to wait their turn, so whilst waiting, we would listen into conversations in order not to miss our turn. After about an hour of listening to strangers talking to each other, it was our turn, and so our radio officer passed my girlfriend's telephone number to the operator at Porter's Head Radio. Her mother answered the phone, she wasn't in. No worries, I'll try again tomorrow. That cost me about $12. Next evening, we did the same again, but this time we had a British warship in the queue ahead of us. The Royal Navy didn't often travel for months at a time like the Merchant Navy, so when they did, they missed their wives and girlfriends terribly. Each warship has hundreds of personnel on board, so it seems all have a desire to call their loved ones on Sunday evening. This time the wait for, was for about three hours long to get eventually connected to my girlfriend. Upon connection, the conversation went something like this. Hi, how are you? I tried to call you last night, but you were out. Did you have a good time? To which her reply was, yes, um, too good. I simply put the phone down as this was the most expensive split up I had ever had. Of course, once the rest of the crew on board found out, thanks to the radio officer, that I had been dumped, I took a verbal bashing for the next few weeks, all in good spirits designed to cheer me up. It wasn't only the communications on board that needed to move with the times, other areas of ship life needed to be updated. However, in spite of the technology, we had on board some things just refused to evolve. Here's a comical little story about something called the Thunderbox. The Thunderbox was basically a makeshift toilet to be used by the shore gangs made from wooden pallets and perched precariously over the guardrail of the ship, allowing the waste to drop into the sea. 
not very nice. This photo was taken on board the Clan McGilvery whilst at anchor off Kakinada in India. The dhows laden with tea were towed out to the ship and their cargo was loaded using the ship's derricks. The empty dhows thereafter would hoist up their sail and sail back to port. The dock crew who stayed on board, sleeping and living on deck, they brought everything with them, including their cooking implements and of course their thunderbox which was rigged, rigged as shown. Boats used to come alongside and offer live chickens or prawns in return for empty paint tins or small drums. So the ship was a busy hub of activity all around her. On one occasion, a docker was occupying the thunderbox whilst the dhow close by, amongst all the hustle and bustle of the other boats, uh, had its sail up and was ready for returning to port. A gust of wind got up and the mast of the dhow collided with the thunderbox. The poor docker in his na naked state had to scramble over the rail as fast as he could whilst in mid motion. Fortunately, the communications have evolved much more quickly. As we moved into the 1980s, communications began to advance. By the early 80s, I started to notice some ships as they passed by had a large white dome fitted above the bridge deck. I soon discovered these were the new satellite phones that could operate by simply picking up the receiver and dialing the telephone number. Sadly for the radio officers, as satellite communications became more commonplace across all ships and GMDSS was introduced for emergency purposes, their numbers dropped off. Now, of course, we are fully GMDSS and most of the communications are by email, telephone and mobile phone. So no ships sail with radio officers and yet they have far more sophisticated electronic equipment on the bridge. Reliability has improved over the years and each ship has backup systems, so if a unit fails, they simply switch to the backup and get the unit fixed at the next port. As I said before, using our email system, our ships are transmitting and receiving on average 66 messages every day. Isn't it amazing that technology has improved so much that by making the radio officer redundant, so by reducing the manpower, a shipping company has more than tripled their efficiency. I think everyone is now fully aware that technology can increase efficiency. After leaving the Merchant Navy, I entered the telecommunications industry, joining Telephone Rentals, initially as a salesman and then promoted to a sales account manager. Excellent professional sales training provided me with good foundations for this change of career. Telephone rentals offered long-term agreements where providing quality service was essential to the customer relationship. So I learned valuable lessons in customer service and customer expectations. The telecommunications market exploded in the UK during the 80s, providing opportunities in abundance. I was the sixth person to join a startup in 1984 called Dialophone in a little shop front office in central Manchester. Within five years, we had 506 staff with offices across the UK and in Europe, having gained valuable experience in running a business, particularly in times of exceptional growth. I left in 1990 to start my own telecommunications business. But unfortunately, the bubble had burst and the UK was in the depths of a recession. Companies were closing down or closing their doors to capital expenditure. So after two years, it was time to call it a day. However, I learned a tremendous amount of, during that short time, a valuable experience that would stand me in good stead for when the opportunity to start afresh came along. Another career move in, in 1994, I joined Marinette Systems, my first venture into the satellite communications industry. Marinette Systems were the pioneers in satellite email, using at that time the Imasat A terminals with Motorola modems at 9600 bits per second. These were the early days of satellite data communications. We were selling our service outright, installing server systems in the ship's operator's offices and installing the software on board ships. At the time, there was no internet. And so we used the CETA airline network to route between offices. Marinette Systems were soon purchased by a US company called Globe Wireless in the 1990s. I knew that subscription business was a better way to offer a service to customers, and it was time to make use of the internet. There was no better time for me to seize the opportunity to start global technology. 
The plan was to build a public hub and offer a satellite email service on a monthly subscription basis, using the internet to transfer the messages to their final destination. One could say that we provided ships with a cloud-based email service, but at the time that terminology was not in use. That was over 20 years ago, and global technology has grown from strength to strength, with 5,600 ships now using our email service all over the world. We process over 380,000 messages daily and boast over 12 months of continuous uptime. I like to think the various careers throughout my working life have each played a part, giving quality contribution to my experiences and so steering me to where we are today as a company. My time at sea has given me the empathy with my customer. It has helped me to appreciate what is happening on board ship as the captain is trying to send his important messages. Also helped me appreciate the importance of reliability in an email service, along with the comfort of complete cybersecurity. My time in telecommunications taught me how important a quality service is to customers, how to customer manage them for a long-term relationship, whilst giving me technical knowledge. My time with Dialophone and my own early startup has given me experience in a growing company and the business knowledge to start Global Technology Limited. I like to think I was brought up with good values, respect for others, treat people the way you would like to be treated. I have a passion for this business and I hope it rubs off on others I work with. These values I have instilled into the fabric of the business and the people appreciate and work within them. My business career has taught me that recruitment will cost money and so it is vitally important to get the right person with the right attitude at the outset. Then teach him or her the job and all it entails. Then, most importantly, treat them well. As Richard Branson says, if you look after your staff, they will look after your customers. All these experiences have brought me to where I am today with a successful satellite data communication service for shipping. So looking forward, GT Maritime has a good reputation in the maritime industry for being the reliable satellite email company for shipping. As data is on the increase, we are best placed to foresee a shift change about to occur as ships and their shipping companies use more and more data. Email numbers are unchanged, but data is on the increase as companies can see the benefit of knowing hard facts in every detail and then using these facts to make important decisions within their operations. We see a transformation about to occur as we move from being a satellite email company to becoming a satellite data communications company for shipping. As we move forward now, this year GT Maritime will launch a data transfer platform that will control all non-voice communications to and from the ship, optimizing and prioritizing whilst ensuring everything is cyber secure in both directions, no matter where the source. With one customizable platform, GT Maritime will build efficiencies into the ship's communications, ensuring the customer retrieves the optimum use from the airtime package they have subscribed to. As VSAT takes over the maritime satellite communications world, we need to embrace this technology and offer the customer a package that will make good, efficient use of their VSAT airtime package. Here's to the next 20 years. Thank you for joining us today and listening to what seems like my life story. I hope you found it interesting and informative. If you have any questions on the webinar or any of the GT Maritime products, you can contact us by emailing sales at gtmaritime.com. Thanks again and have a great day.